All right, so if you're ready to go, uh, maybe we'll fire up. So welcome back to the first talk of the afternoon session. Uh, our speaker is Tom Bridgeland, uh, coming to us via Zoom from Sheffield. Um, his title is Cluster Varieties and Stability Spaces. Um, if you have a question during the talk, if you're on Zoom, just you know shout your question out. If you're here in the room, just raise your hand and we'll give you the microphone. And that way, uh, Tom will be able to hear your question. Uh, all right, take it away, Tom. Okay, well, thank you. I'd like to uh, yeah, very much thank the organizers for all their hard work and for giving me the honor of uh, speaking at this, um, at this meeting. So, um, I mean, I've derived so much inspiration from um, Sasha's papers over the years. Um, I mean, I'm sort of const constantly leafing through them. Um, there's, there's so much in them that, uh, you know, you can always find something new that you didn't notice before. So um, anyway, it's, uh, it's a really great pleasure to be able to uh, take part and uh, to wish him a belated happy birthday. Um, uh, I'm just sorry I can't join you in person, but uh, anyway, I'm sure you're gonna have a, a great week. So when I was invited to speak, I decided it would be good to talk about uh, this relationship between cluster varieties and stability spaces, um, partly because it's something I had um, a, a very interesting email exchange with Sasha about, um, sort of about a year and a half ago. And um, I, I sort of did that thing where you give a title and an abstract in the hope that it will make you work out the details. Um, and at the time I was expecting a transatlantic flight, which would have been perfect, but uh, that didn't quite happen. So um, this is gonna be a bit of a report on a, a you know, work in progress really. Okay, so the basic point is that uh, uh, given a quiver, there are these, there are kind of two spaces you can associate to it. One is um, the cluster variety, cluster Poisson variety, and the other is a space of stability conditions. And these two look, things look uh, kind of intriguingly similar, and it's kind of long been a bit of a challenge to try to work out exactly how they should fit together. So let me just kind of set up the notation. Um, so Q is going to be some two acyclic quiver, so no loops or two cycles. Um, and for the purposes of stability conditions and so on, I should choose a generic potential on that quiver. And um, I do that so that I can define this Ginsberg algebra and um, take its bounded derived category. So, um, you know, perhaps surprisingly, all these details are not going to play a big role in this talk. So don't worry if this is uh, foreign stuff. Um, but anyway, the main point is that this is um, an example of a triangulated, uh, a triangulated category with the three-dimensional kalabi yau property. So it's like, in, in some sense, a simpler version of the derived category of coherent sheaves on a kalabi yau threefold. Um, and associated to any such, well, any triangulated category, you can consider this thing called the space of stability conditions, which um, is a complex manifold and its points parameterize some kinds of internal structure on this triangulated category. Okay, and it also has a Poisson structure. Um, and yeah, so I want to compare this thing with the cluster Poisson variety. Um, a I should be a little bit more precise. I don't really want to think about exactly this thing. So first I should take, uh, there's actually a distinguished connected component in this space. And then I want to quotient that by some group, which is this um, generalized braid group. Um, and, you know, the way you think about that, or the way you define that is that to each of your, the vertices of your quiver, there is a simple representation for this um, Ginsberg algebra, just a one dimensional representation. And that object, because we've assumed there are no loops, that object is a spherical object, and it therefore defines an um, a spherical autoequivalence of this um, uh, triangulated category. So I take the, guy, the subgroup generated by those things and that defines this braid group. And I want to think about the quotient of that connected component by that group. And so the point somehow is that sitting inside that, there is um, a subset which um, has a, a purely combinatorial definition and uses the same 
combinatorics as the definition of the cluster variety. In other words, it, you know, it's defined in terms of the exchange graph. Okay. Um, right, well, we'll come, we'll come to that explicitly in a minute. So, yeah, so this is the question that we're addressing really. Um, yeah, how does this space compare with the uh, cluster plus on variety? Um, and the two basic classes of examples, which are in some ways, well, anyway, those are the ones where this is likely to have a nice answer, um, are the following. So either Q is of finite type, so mutation equivalent to a Dinkin diagram, or Q is one of these quivers that arises from a, a triangulation of a marked bordered surface. Um, so I call these of class SA1, but I should emphasize that I'm really talking about the group SL2, you know, so the, the, the simplest examples, um, uh, not, not the ones relevant to higher types of theory. Okay, so, you know, so just think about like the AN quiver or something. Here we've got two n-dimensional complex manifolds with Poisson structures. They both have some combinatorial description in terms of the exchange graph of the AN quiver. And the question is, what's the relationship between them? Um, and, you know, it's, yeah, okay. So this is, um, this is the sort of thing that I hope is true. And I guess I probably know it's true. Um, well, I know it's true for the A2 quiver anyway. Um, but I think we're quite close to understanding this in those two classes of examples. And that's what I will describe in this talk. So um, on the one hand, there should be a complex hyperkähler structure on the total space of the tangent bundle to this space of stability conditions. Um, okay, so just as I was finishing writing these slides, I realized that that couldn't, you know, I, I need to put the small print in that um, I should restrict first to a symplectic leaf in this space S, or instead of complex hyperkähler structure, I should, there's kind of an obvious way to generalize to the Poisson case. But anyway, so basically there's a complex hyperkähler structure here. Um, and this is something I've been pursuing for a while, not just in the quiver setting, but sort of more generally, when you have one of these three-dimensional calabi yau categories, um, you have, you can define Donaldson-Thomas invariants, and then the question was somehow, how do you, um, in, you know, is there some geometric structure encoded by those invariants? And this was very much inspired by work of uh, Gaiato, Moore, and Nikeski from more than 10 years ago, who kind of explained um, that, well, that there is hyperkähler geometry associated to DT invariants, and they, and they explained this very beautiful example of the, of the Hitchin system. Um, so the thing I'm discussing here is not quite the same as that story. Um, it has lots of things in common, but it's what physicists would call the conformal limit. Um, and uh, as I hope I'll find time to say, it means that this, um, on the one hand, you get something that's a complex hyperkähler structure. So everything here is kind of holomorphic. And on the other, um, it's actually much simpler than something like the, the Hitchin metric. Um, so for example, in the case of the A2 quiver, you can actually write that write down this thing explicitly using algebraic, using rational functions. Okay. Um, but anyway, so the, the more relevant thing for this talk is that when you have one of these hyperkähler structures, you can take its twister space. Um, and then the expectation is that basically the central five, you know, there is a C star action on, on this twister space, lifting the C star action on P1. So the only fibers we have to discuss are kind of over zero, one, and infinity. And basically the fiber over zero is the um, stability space. And the fiber over one is an etal cover of this um, cluster Poisson variety. Although both of those things, uh, I think to be true, we should first quotient out by the cluster modular group. Um, so I, I, I sort of emailed Sasha about this and said, you know, could something like this be true? And basically he, he sent me back a, a very detailed email and he'd been thinking along very similar lines. Um, although maybe he was more, you know, the hyperkähler geometry he was thinking about was probably more real hyperkähler geometry. But uh, in any case, um, 
very similar ideas have been known to Sasha for probably quite a long time. Um, and what did I want to say about this? Yeah, so, so somehow the point is that um, the way you try to get at these complex hypercalar structures is you try to solve these um, things which are, uh, um, you solve these Riemann-Hilbert problems. So some of you have probably heard me talk or Andy, I mean, it's the same sort of setup that uh, GMN were considering. You, you, you write down a Riemann-Hilbert problem um, determined by the Donaldson-Thomas invariance. And, uh, you know, it's a Riemann-Hilbert problem in the plane, in the complex plane, with jumps across a bunch of rays. Um, and the idea here is somehow that um, solving those Riemann-Hilbert pr problems is basically constructing twister lines in this twister space. So the hope is that this complex hypercalar structure is a rather hard thing to get your hands on because it involves solving these very difficult Riemann-Hilbert problems. But maybe by just understanding the geometry of this twister space, you can construct their solutions. Um, well, you know, kind of implicitly by saying, by, by well, using the standard twister trick of encoding everything in the analytic geometry of this um, twister space. So that's somehow the hope. That's why I would like to understand the geometry of this twister space. Um, and then there's one more thing that's sort of icing on the cake, um, which is that eventually there should. I mean, and this I'm pretty vague on for now, but there should be some canonical line bundle with flat connection on this hypercalar manifold T, such that the local flat sections give interesting functions that you know, occur in, um, in physics. So I basically just know a few sporadic examples of this. Um, in particular, I know how to do this in the case of the A2 quiver, and the function you get is um, the Panlevé tau function, Panlevé 1 tau function. Um, there's also an example relating to the resolved conifold, where, um, where the, you take the derived category of coherent sheaves on the resolved conifold, and there the function you get is the um, topological string partition function of that conifold. And somehow the exciting thing about that is you're getting this non-perturbatively, you're getting some analytic function whose asymptotic expansion is the gromov witten genus expansion. But somehow to understand, you know, it, it's something that people are thinking about a lot in theoretical physics at the minute is trying to understand um, the uh, kind of global analytic properties of these functions using Borel resummation and things like this. Um, and somehow that is very much related to the geometry of this twister space. Um, anyway, this, yes, okay. But we, maybe I'll mention this right at the end if I get time. Okay, so that was the very sort of high tech vague slide. Um, and then we're just going to go to some, try and, so, that, so most of the rest of the talk is going to be about this, the twister space. Um, and I want to try to construct it in two different ways, in, in two classes of examples. So first, let's uh, discuss um, a combinatorial approach to this. So, um, yeah, so let's start with the definition of uh, the cluster Poisson variety. And, um, in a moment of uh, lack of confidence, I said, let's just assume that Q is of finite type. Um, well, I mean, these definitions are going to make sense otherwise, but uh, whether they give a good answer in general is a bit open. Okay, so what we want to do is take, um, well, uh, yeah, I'm sure everybody knows this stuff. So we take the exchange graph and we take a copy of the torus, C star to the N for each of the vertices of the exchange graph and then we glue them using birational maps corresponding to the edges of this graph, which are mutations of quivers. Okay. So that's, um, that's the sort of standard definition of this Poisson variety. And I guess in general, what you get is um, non-separated, right? So, or I'm thinking this is a complex manifold, it's a non hausdorff complex manifold in general. Um, and then this stability space, remember I've quotiented out by this braid group, has a similar description. Well, again, I should take some basic object for each vertex of my exchange graph, and then I should glue along edges. But this time it's, it's kind of very different as well in that before these tori were being glued by 
overlapping, you know, they were glued by birational maps. Whereas here, this is more like I take the disjoint union of these things and I glue them along their boundaries. Okay. So, you know, this space is, um, it basically has two N boundary components because each of the, um, each of the ZIs, each of the coordinates can go um, to the real axis, but because we've punctured, it can either go to the positive real axis or the negative real axis. And so you get two kind of um, gluings on those two axes. So what's going on here from the point of view of stability space is that um, the exchange graph parameterizes um, uh, well, certain T structures um, up to the action of this braid group. Okay. Um, and the edges of the exchange graph correspond to an operation called tilting. So every T structure has a heart, so it's some abelian category sitting inside your triangulated category. And when two things are related by a tilt, it means those abelian categories are almost the same. You've just taken a single simple object and taken it out of the T-structure and put its shift in. Okay, so it's some very basic operation on T-structures, and that's what the edges in this exchange graph are measuring. And so if you know a bit about stability conditions, one way to define a stability condition is a T-structure with a um, central charge, which is, takes values in the upper half plane on the objects of the abelian category. Um, so, these coordinates are the central charges of the simple objects in the heart of the T-structure. And this gluing is just describing what happens, you know, basically that the new, as you do one of these tilts, the, the new simple objects are related to the old ones by a formula like this in the Brayton Okay. So, so that's what's happening. It's a little bit tricky, this though. You have to be a bit careful because, um, so what do we really mean here? We're gonna take the disjoint union of these things and then quotient by an equivalence relation, which is somehow generated by this operation along the edges. But we have to make it transitive. So, you know, things could get glued. I mean, it's, this kind of is obviously gonna work well in codimension one, but when you think about higher codimension, it's not completely obvious that what you get here is a manifold. Um, but anyway, by, um, yeah, and well, and in a related issue is that if this Q, for a general quiver Q, the set of stability conditions that you get this way is not open. So it's not gonna be an open subset. Um, yeah, so, so there is some kind of trickiness that's here, but, but when Q is of finite type, that's what, it's particularly nice. This way, you're just gonna get the whole of stability space. So, so this, this, yeah, the whole of stability space uh, well, I guess I should say a whole connected component of stability space can be uh, partitioned like this into copies of the upper half plane. Okay, so you can see that going from here to here is like a kind of tropicalization. So what I want to do is now try to define this um, twister space, which degenerates from, you know, which kind of um, passes between the cluster Poisson variety and the stability space. So the idea is you first take um, an etal cover, which is going to be this thing. So, um, so I want to define something that I, I'm going to call the log cluster space, which is basically, I just take the cluster transformations we had before, but I take their logs everywhere. Okay, so these little x's are the logs of the big x's before. Um, and so then they trans transform like this. This is exactly the same formula I had before, except I've just taken log everywhere. But then I'm going to do something a bit different. You see, before I just had uh, the big x's were just in... Um, uh, a torus, C star to the N, but now I'm going to let these, I'm going to insist that these lie in H to the N, upper half plane to the N. And notice I haven't punctured here, which is maybe a little bit strange. Um, so I, I glue things like this. And then it's kind of, ob well, it's completely obvious that, oh uh, yeah, I should mention something first, that Notice you might be worried, a little bit worried about this log, but again, I'm gluing these things along their boundaries. So along their boundaries, these XIs are real, right? So XIs are living in the upper half plane, 
And along the boundaries, this is real. So I can certainly take this long. There's no, there's no multivaluedness or anything. And then the claim is that setting big x equals this defines a continuous map to the cluster Poisson variety we had before. Well, that's kind of clear. Um, this is something that Sasha pointed out. Ah, it's a question, maybe. Uh, um, a little question. You, you glue along the whole boundary or just uh, along, for example, positive numbers or something like that? No, I want to glue along the whole boundary, yes. So if you glue two pieces uh, together, so you have no more boundary remaining, or? Um, that's right, yeah. Is so that just what? Because it, as far as I understand, you iterate the, the mutation. So you can glue, you can glue along several mutations. Uh, how you can once you glue, you have no more boundary. What what me? Well, I mean, but these spaces have lots of boundaries, right? Um, I mean, if there were, you're thinking if we were in a one-dimensional situation, or no? I mean, well, it has one boundary component. Boundary. Ah, uh, uh, I, I, uh, mm -hmm. um, ah, I see. Sorry, sorry, I understand that. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Oh, thank, thank you. Me, I also I find this quite confusing, but I, I hope this is okay. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, so if you, if you maybe this helps as well. I mean this this observation. I mean this is well. This was the way Sasha was thinking. Um, he was taking the product of the real positive points of the cluster variety with the tropical points, um, and and really I guess. In general, you just want to think about the positive ones, the union of the cones. But uh, in this finite time case, I don't need to. I don't need to say that. And how am I getting that? Well, somehow the imaginary part of this um, cluster transformation is not doing very much because this change here is all real. Okay, that's what I said. That this guy is real. So we're just changing things by real um, by real things. So if I just think about the imaginary part, all I'm doing is changing the sign of the ith component. And you know, in that way, that's the same transformation law that defines the, uh, the tropical cluster space. And then the fibers are transforming as, as the real um, points, positive real points of the, of the ordinary cluster variety. So I claim there is a homeomorphism like this. But then the tricky thing, and this is unfortunately the thing that I don't know how to prove, um, is that um, this exponential map from L to X should be a local homeomorphism. So, uh, I mean, I'm going to explain why this is true in the A2 case on the next slide. Um, and I'm going to give you some evidence as to why you should expect this to be true for these class SA1 examples. Um, but I think this is kind of an interesting question um, to whether this is an isomorphism, or whether it's a local homeomorphism. But if it is, then of course I can use this to define a complex structure on L, uh, the structure of a complex manifold, and then by definition X is a tau. Okay. So um, yeah, so this is I, I sort of um, I hope people who are better at cluster theory than me will be able to uh, think about this and uh, tell me whether it's true or not. Um, Okay, and I should just comment that since we already know, I mean, so this is just R plus to the N, and this is R to the N. So this is certainly a, um, a smooth manifold. And so it will be enough to show that uh, this map is locally injected by invariance of domain. So that's what we'll need to try to do. Okay, so let me just try and explain um, how this works in the A2 case. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll just say one other comment first. Um, so suppose I take a point um, in the interior of one of these cells. Then it's obvious that the map is X, is a local homeomorphism near there, because nothing is being glued near there. Remember, I'm just gluing these cells along their boundaries. So, um, uh, and the exponential map is a local homeomorphism. So, you know, there's nothing to prove here on the interior of the cells. The problem is along the boundaries. And actually, co-dimension one boundaries are pretty easy to think about. But 
it, it gets worse as you go to higher co-dimension. And so actually the worst case is the one to think about, which is where all these XIs are real. So you're kind of simultaneously on all the boundaries. Okay, so let's just think about that case. So take a point in the real, positive real cluster variety and take some small neighborhood in the complex cluster variety. And for each seed, there is some cluster chart and all these things will take real values, positive real values on this point because the cluster transformations preserve that. But now we can look at the neighborhood, the points of the neighborhood where all these are positive. Oh, sorry, all these have positive arguments. Okay, so P0, they all have zero argument, but we can look at the part of the space we get by such that, you know, all these move in a positive direction. And the claim is that those subsets are disjoint because somehow these locally are the images of the corresponding cell, right? Because, you know, the cell in the log cluster variety is gotten by taking log of these XIs and asking that they're in the upper half plane. So that's why I need the arguments to be positive for them to be in the image of that cell. So let's just think about the A2 case for a minute. So here are the kind of five charts on the A2 cluster variety. And there's a Z5 action here. So we might as well assume, um, yeah, so, so what we have to worry about is whether there are two um, seeds. Um, so yeah, so we want to worry about the possibility that two of these subsets overlap. Okay, so by symmetry, we can we can might as well assume that the arguments of x one and x two. Sorry, these should be all capital X's. I apologize for that. So we can assume that the arguments of these two are positive, and then the worry is that the arguments of say these two are positive as well, and that would violate this condition. But certainly, well, certainly these can't be right because you know if these two are positive, then one over x one has negative arguments, and similarly, this one is forbidden. And you can just see that in every case, there is something that has clearly has a negative argument. So here, if x1 and x2 are positive arguments, then this guy has negative argument. So that's basically what's going on in this A2 case. Um, but whether there's sort of combinatorics can be pushed to it. More general cases, I don't know. Um, I think so. Okay, so let's, but let's assume that conjecture. And then how do we build this? We still haven't built this twister space. I've just built some et al cover of the usual Poisson variety. So what the next step is to build some space fibering over the blow up of um, the complex numbers at the origin. And then we'll blow down again. Okay. So yeah, so we just think about the blow up of the origin in the complex numbers. That's the space, that's just a, an infinite cylinder. So it's um, circle cross um, non-negative reals like this. So this is, yeah, what am I saying? There's an argument and a modulus, but you allow the modulus to go to zero. And then we can just do the same construction as we did before, um, sticking in this parameter C star. Okay, so it's, Instead of gluing upper half planes, I glue rotated upper half planes and I stick an epsilon in everywhere. And so when epsilon equals one, this reduces to what we had before and gives that log cluster variety. Um, but the point about this is that this extends um, as R goes to zero. So, um, you know, this log has a well defined limit as. Um, as R goes to zero. Um, and when you take that limit, you get exactly the formula. Well, um, yeah, you, I mean, certainly if you take the limit with P3 equals zero, you get exactly the formula that I gave before for the stability space. Um, so what you end up with out, out of this story is you get a space fibering over this blower such that the fibers away from the boundary are this log cluster variety and the fibers along the boundary are um, this stability space. Um, and you know, one thing to 
notice just that there is a C star action on here where I just rescale W. I rescale all the Ws and the epsilon. Okay. That makes kind of clear from the form of this formula that you can do that. So that tells you that all the fibers are isomorphic um, away from the boundary and also the all the fibers on the above the boundary are isomorphic. And so then the final step is to blow down the boundary of this um, resulting space Z hat. And this, is, this uses a trick I learned from Kinsevich and Solomon's paper on resurgence. Um, and actually, I haven't fully digested it. So, <laughs> um, so but actually, before we do that, there is a, there's an interesting point here, which is also somewhat confusing. Um, so I've already said that there's a C star action on this space. So um, that tells you that you can identify all the different um, the fibers over all the points of this boundary circle. But there's actually another way of identifying them, which is important here. Um, you see, that was a kind of a trivial identification. It just, the way to think about a point here is that you have a stability condition plus you have also chosen a phase, theta. And what that means in terms of stability conditions, once you've chosen a phase, you have a heart. You, you can look at the objects with phases between theta and theta plus one. Um, and so that's what gives you the decomposition of stability space into these chambers. So there are kind of two ways of moving around this circle. One is just using that C star action which doesn't move you, it doesn't cross any walls because all it's happening is that you change the phase you're thinking about and you rotate the central charge. So if you're worrying about objects being of a particular phase, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything because you've changed the central charge and changed the phase. But there's another way of moving around this circle, which is to fix the central charge and change the phase. And when you do that, you will cross walls where some objects you know, move from the heart and out. So, um, yeah, which is a long way of saying that there's another way of identifying all these points, um, uh, which locally is given by fixing the central charge, so fixing these points WI, right? So remember that we had this condition that somehow WI over, uh, where is it, sorry, WI over epsilon, uh, well, WI has to be in here. So if we fix WI and vary theta, that's going to break at some point, and then you're going to have to sort of cross a wall. You're going to have to move to a different chamber. So this second action I'm talking about is a more subtle thing that involves changing from one chamber to the next. Um, but from the point of view of stability space, it's completely natural. It's just saying fix the stability condition and vary this phase you're thinking about. Okay. But there is a subtlety here, which is that when you, once you understand this, when you go all the way around, there is some monotone. So this identification, um, yeah, involves some shift, the second shift. Um, yeah, basically just because, yeah, anyway, um, that, that, <laughs> this stuff is very confusing. Um, so, and, and that's bad because I want things to be trivial on this circle so I can contract the circle. So my solution to that is to quotient by this action, the action of this autoequivalence, and in fact, go further and actually just quotient by the whole cluster modular group. So in this finite type case, you can identify the cluster modular group with autoequivalences of this category modulo, this should say braid, the braid group. Um, so uh, this shift defines me an element of this group. Um, and in fact, that's a very famous element. It's an interesting element. That shift by one corresponds to the DT transformation of uh, Donchoff and Shen. So, um, yeah, so we could just quotient by that guy, but we're, instead I'm going to choose to quotient by this whole group. Now the boundary is a product, and so now you stand some chance of contracting it. Um, and then there is this... Um, procedure that's described by Kinsevich and Seidman in this in a very similar context, 
where you can now contract that, um, that circle and end up with a, a complex manifold fibering over C now with the space, you know, the fiber over the origin being this, stability space and the fiber over not the origin being um, this log cluster variety. Okay, so that's, um, that's the construction. There are obviously some, a, a few details to be checked here, but the main problem is this conjecture. Can you, can you show that this exponential map is a local homeomorphism? Okay, so that's the end of this part. So if anyone wants to yell any questions, that now's a good time. Yeah, okay. So let me now try to explain this geometrically in, um, in these class S A1 examples. So remember what we're basically looking for is a space fibering over C or CP1 whose central fiber is stability space and whose general fiber is an et al cover of the cluster variety. So, um, so let's just recall this class of quivers. So as I say, this is the group SL2C. Um, so we're gonna fix some genus and some bunch of pole orders. And you can encode that in a marked bordered surface. So it's some genus G surface with some um, boundary components. And these MIs are basically encoding the number of marked points on these boundary components. So MI minus two. And I'm going to assume that there are no punctures because punctures make life difficult, basically. Um, and then if you take some ideal triangulation of this marked bordered surface, so the vertices of the triangulation are at these marked points, then you get a quiver with potential by this procedure. So here's, here's the triangles of your triangulation, these dotted lines, and then you inscribe these triangles and you get a quiver. And the potential is the sum of the obvious cycles here, plus cycle and a minus cycle. And then the point of this um, from, from the whole stability conditions point of view is that, um, um, that if you change the triangulation by a flip, then this induces a mutation of the quiver with potential. And then by results of Keller and Yang, that tells you that, um, that the derived category of the Ginzburg algebra doesn't change. So there is a single CY3 triangulated category associated to this marked bordered surface. And the triangulations are just telling you about different T structures inside that triangulated category. See how I'm getting off time. Um, okay. So thanks to, um, well, here's what we, you know, there are some basic theorems about this stuff. So um, the cluster modular group is the mapping class group of this surface. And the space of stability conditions, um, if I mod out by this group, um, this parameterizes pairs consisting of a Riemann surface of genus G and a quadratic differential on C with poles of these orders and simple zeros um, and considered up to the obvious isomorphism. Okay, so this is a, um, a result of mine with Ivan Smith. Um, and then the corresponding work, well, of course, this came first, work of um, Fock and Gontrov, um, this statement that um, the um, cluster X variety um, is the space of framed local systems on the surface S. So, I mean, just to try and keep the symmetry with this, I've modded out by this, I hope I've done this right, I've modded out by the cluster modular group. Um, and so, well, it's still framed local systems on S, but now up to orientation preserving diffeomorphisms of this um, surface. So the basic data is a, is a local system, but then you have this framing data of a choice of flat section along the boundary components. So, you know, geometrically, we have to get between these two things to define um, this twister space. 
So let's just uh, go through how that works in the case of the A2 example. So, um, so the vertices uh, of the exchange graph are the five different triangulations of this pentagon. Um, and the cluster modular group is just Z mod 5Z, just thinking about, thought of as rotating this pentagon. And then the space of um, the quadratic differentials in question here have a single pole of order seven. So this is the case M equals seven. And those are differentials of this form on P1. Um, and uh, what do I want to say about that? Oh yeah, but, but we always insist that these quadratic differentials have simple zeros. So that's this discriminant condition here. So the, this space S is C2 minus the discriminant locus. And then I, I said that the stability space is a union of five chambers, five copies of the upper half plane squared. And those correspond to those chambers correspond to differentials with a fixed WKV triangulation. So um, if you choose a generic differential like this and look at its horizontal trajectories, then most of them will go from the pole, go, yeah, go from the pole at infinity to the pole at infinity. And they will all approach infinity along one of five directions, which are, you know, basically you've blown up, the, you've taken the real oriented blow up of the point at infinity and marked the five asymptotic directions on the boundary. And so all trajectories approach infinity basically a lot by hitting one of these blobs. And there are certain special trajectories which emerge from one of the zeros of the differential. So this differential has three zeros. And there are some trajectories which emerge from the zeros and pass to infinity. And they break up your surface into these cells. And every other trajectory is just going like this, going from one of these points at infinity to another. And so that defines for you a triangulation of your surface. And once you fix that triangulation, the stability of the, the quadratic differential is determined by the periods, these periods along the path connecting this zero to this zero or this zero to this zero. So that's why you get um, a copy of the upper half plane squared. This h squared is just parameterizing this period and this period. Um, yeah. On the other hand, th this cluster variety is um, moduli space of five points of P1, except, you know, associated to the five vertices of this pentagon, except that you're not allowed to have two adjacent ones be. And then these cluster coordinates are the cross ratios of, you know, so for instance, if you take one of these edges, you take the cross ratio of the corresponding four points on the quadrat. Okay, so it's all quite explicit, particularly in these simple cases. And so how are we gonna get between the cluster variety and the space of stability conditions? We're gonna use um, projective structures. So, um, so I'm sure most of you know, so I'm talking about P1 structures. So a projective structure um, on a Riemann surface is a covering by holomorphic charts whose transition functions are elements, are Mobius transformations, just elements of PGL2. And there's two basic facts we're going to need about these things. So the first one is that the set of projective structures on a fixed Riemann surface C is an affine space for the space of quadratic differentials. And this is kind of a, it's a non-trivial thing. I mean, yeah. So there's two ways around of seeing this. Um, if you give me two projective structures, then what I can do is I can take charts in each of them and then I can compute the Schwarzian derivative. So, you know, I have two functions Z and W on P1 and I compute the Schwarzian derivative and write DW squared. And that gives me a quadratic differential. Or the other thing, you know, since this is an affine space, I should be able to add a quadratic differential, right? And how do I do that? Well, I write, I take a coordinate in the first projective structure. I write my quadratic differential in terms of that coordinate, something dz squared. And then I look at solutions to this second order ODE and take the ratio of two of those solutions. That gives me a map to P1 and that's, an element, that's a chart in the other projective structure, the, the one obtained by adding Q. So there is some kind of interesting stuff going on there. 
And then the other thing we need to know about these things is that they have monodromy. So you can glue these charts um, on the universal cover to obtain a map from the universal cover of C to P1, um, unique up to the action of PGL2. And then you can take the monodromy of this so that you know, if you go around a loop in C, then you know, your chart changes by this element of PGL2. So yeah, so they have monodromy. Okay, so now we're, now we're looking in good shape, right? Because these, these things have something to do with quadratic differentials and they have something to do with local systems. So now we can form a space of projective structures. So these are going to parameterize a compact Riemann surface of genus G with a projective structure on it, um, up to isomorphism, yeah, up to the obvious notion of equivalence. And now there's an obvious map, just remembering the curve C and forgetting the projective structure. And by what we said before, this is an affine bundle for the vector bundle, which is, I guess, actually the cotangent bundle squared of Mg. And, you know, if I define um, the character stack and the mapping class group, I guess, in this holomorphic, at the minute we're still talking about holomorphic objects, um, then you can take the monodromy of a projective structure um, because we haven't marked the surface, I need to quotient out by the mapping class group here. And then it's a theorem of Hedgehog that this map is um, et al. It's a local homeomorphism. And it's also complex for the, for the yeah, it's also holomorphic. Um, yeah, I probably should have said, but this statement gives me a, a uh, the structure of a complex manifold on PG. And then the statement is that this map is et al. Okay. So, you know, so we're nearly there. We have an et al cover of the character variety and we're getting um, an affine bundle for a vector bundle. So now we just use the, um, the trivial construction that degenerates, there is a degeneration from an affine bundle to the vector bundle. Okay, so this is just a trivial construction. Um, let's suppose we have some affine space for a vector space, then you can let the vector space act on this product by this formula and take the quotient. Then what you'll find is that you have a projection to C whose fibers are the affine space and the vector space. Um, and there is an induced C star action, so the only different fibers are the one over one and the one over zero, and that's the vector space and the affine space. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is just like uh, the construction of lambda, you know, the, uh, the construction of lambda connections, you know, passing between flat connections and um, Higgs bundles. Right. Um, you know, flat connections on a bundle are an affine space for Higgs fields on the bundle. You know, just doing the same, the same construction. And so, if we apply this fiberwise over Mg, we'll get a degeneration from Pg to Qg. And then, you know, I keep, of course, you know, stability conditions were. It was important to sort of take out the. Um, well, the space of stability conditions had. Um, was quadratic differentials with simple zeros. Of course, we can just fix that. We can just take out the repeated zero guys from the central fiber. I don't think it would have made much sense to, yeah, I mean, you, yeah, you can do that. And I just, I just note this because it's a little bit, um, it's related to the fact that when we defined that um, combinatorial approach, we had the punctured half plane for stability conditions, whereas we had the full half plane for projective structures. Um, I guess if we'd done the same thing with the full half planes in the stability space, we would probably have got something that looks like the whole of Q of G, but I, I couldn't be sure about that. Um, okay, so basically, we, you know, this answers our question and we just do the same thing, but now um, um, with mer in the meromorphic setting. So, you know, here, here are some references. So, 
you can consider a space of projective structures with poles. So, so I should say, what, what does that mean? Well, we've said that, um, uh, yeah, I mean, a projective structure, projective structures form an affine space over quadratic differentials. Yeah, I, yeah, actually, the most concrete way of saying it is you just, you take a ratio of solution, you, you just look at this. Um, you look at an equation like this with Q having poles. So you take a ratio of solutions of an equation like this where Q has poles of fixed orders and you call that a projective structure with poles of those orders. Um, and so, uh, sorry, yeah, so then there's this um, theorem, which uh, the very first part is due to Dylan Allegretti and myself, which is just that there is a map. If you take the monodromy of a meromorphic projective structure, you get to um, this space of framed local systems. So what that is about is basically you consider that differential equation and you have to think about Stokes data. But, you know, in general, these poles have high order. And so you're thinking about a differential equation with a high order pole at some point. And you have to think about the Stokes behavior. You know, you have to think about the generalized monodromy of that um, equation. So, you know, but this is a, a kind of a standard thing. You uh, goes back to work of Sibuya or, well, presumably a lot further back. Um, but there are these um, subdominant solutions in, in um, sectors, and those are exactly what you need to define the, the framing of the local system. And then we proved that, um, yeah, we proved that you end up in the regular part. So the place, ah, yeah, I probably told a lie on an earlier slide. Um, we proved that we ended up, you ended up in the place which is the union of the cluster charts. Um, so I guess the whole framed local system moduli space is not, um, you know, the cluster charts don't cover that, but we ended up proving that you, you end up in, in the cluster variety. And then Gupta and Mudge proved that, you know, the, the, the more impressive results that this is et al and subjective. So the et al being the analog of um, the hedge half theory. Um, so now we just apply the same construction before and we get, you know, what we were after really, a, a map to see whose central fiber is the stability space and whose um, fiber over one is a map, has a map, an et al map to the, um, to the cluster variety. And then the conjecture would be that this space is isomorphic to the one I defined combinatorially before. Um, and, you know, this was the homework I had hoped to have done. Sorry, Sasha, I didn't do it. Um, there is a, a very interesting paper of Gupta and Much who use um, an argument of, you know, generalized work of Thurston um, to give a grafting parameterization of this space of projective structures in this meromorphic setting. Um, so this means that they've marked their surfaces. So, you know, yeah, they've chosen a marking and then they're getting um, some Teichmuller space and some measured laminations. And the hope would be, I mean, it's basically, I suppose, just really checking all the definitions match up, um, but this should be the positive real points of the cluster variety. And this should be the tropical cluster variety. And so remember, in the, in the case of the log cluster variety, we have this product of those two things. But anyway, there's definitely some, some things to check there. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I'm hoping that, you know, if, if we follow this through, it will give um, a, a very indirect proof of that um, conjecture about the ex exponential map being a local homeomorphism. Um, but um, yeah, that needs to be checked. Okay. So um, I want to finish by just talking about um, really what my motivation for all this was, or, or my point of view. So I've been talking about this twister space and I gave sort of two approaches to it. One combinatorial one, just using kind of cluster style definitions. 
And another, you know, specific to um, the case of these theories of class S, um, I suppose I think that in general, a more robust thing is the space of stability conditions with this complex hyperkähler structure on it. Um, that will have a twister space, but I suppose the twister space in general could be pretty badly behaved. And yeah, so maybe, maybe it's better to think about this. But I just wanted to ex explain what I mean by complex hyperkähler structure and just explain that it's not, um, well, it's not very complicated, basically. So there is a geometric way of thinking about these things, which is as follows. So let's take some complex manifold. So this will be my stability space. But for now, it's just a complex manifold. And I want to think about the total space of its tangent function. OK, so um, it's good to think about this diagram. So this is just, I'm just writing down, there's a projection from T to S. And I'm just writing down the derivative of that projection. So it goes from the tangent space of T to the tangent space of S. But it's good to put this so all the bundles are on the same space. So the kernel of this map, of course, is the vertical tangent directions to the projection. And those are canonically identified with TS because this is the tangent bump. Okay, so there is a canonical isomorphism here. The vertical tangent directions are the tangent directions to the, to the base. And then what we want to think about is a um, splitting. So a splitting of this map, that's exactly what a nonlinear, you know, that's an Erisman connection or nonlinear connection on the map pi. Okay, so that's what we want to think about. And then when we have one of those, we can consider a whole family of them by just adding um, adding multiples of this map. Okay, so adding vertical lips. And here, epsilon is the same parameter that's appearing everywhere, but it appears with an inverse. And so um, we're also in the situation where we have some symplectic form omega on S. So again, this is this thing, I should have really, I should fix a symplectic leaf. In, the stability space is a Poisson manifold, I should fix a symplectic leaf. Um, and so the fibers of this map are symplectic manifolds. They're just, um, they're just the tangent spaces to S, and they're just symplectic vector spaces, in fact. And so what I want to insist is that these connections, the kind of parallel transport of these nonlinear connections, um, preserve that symplectic structure, but not the linear structure. That would be a linear connection. But just preserve the symplectic structure. And I also want them all to be flat. Okay, so here's, here's the picture, here's the base, here's the tangent space, and we're basically thinking about lifting tangent vectors downstairs to upstairs so that they, they map back down to here. So each tangent space downstairs corresponds to a vertical tangent direction here because this fiber is just the tangent space. And yeah, so this... Erisman connection is all about lifting Y to a horizontal lift at each point in the fiber. And there is no relationship between the lifts here and here. You know, there would be if it was a linear connection, but here not. And then, you know, if you have a vector field down here, then locally we can parallel transport. And so we'll get a map from some region here to some region here. And the claim is that this should be symplectic. So that's the structure that we, we sort of expect to find on stability space in the, well, at least in simple examples. So there is, there is a, there's a big problem with this whole story, which is that, I mean, in general, it's all about DT invariance. And in general, for a Calabi R3 category, the DT invariance could grow very fast and that will cause all sorts of trouble. But, um, but really what we're thinking about here is simple examples um, where the DT invariants are quite controlled, and then we should expect this kind of um, structure. And so once, once you have this um, splitting, once you have this um, pencil of connections, um, you can split the tangent bundle upstairs into the sum of the, you know, the image of the, well, so there's the vertical tangent 
directions and the horizontal guns. And so that gives me a splitting of, into two copies of the tangent bundle downstairs. And so we can now just write block diagonal matrices, basically, or block, block matrices for the operators i, j, and k, and for the metric. So here, this is the symplectic form downstairs. And then, you know, so what I mean by a complex hyperkähler structure is a complex manifold with operators like this on the, on the holomorphic tangent bundle, and also a complex metric, a holomorphic metric, um, and such that these operators should be parallel for the levy chibita, um, and they should preserve the metric. And so basically this data is just equivalent to this pencil of connections, bit, sorry, the condition that these operators preserve G and are parallel is equivalent to the condition that um, this pencil of connections was flat and symplectic. Okay. And so then, you know, so, so that's somehow, you know, although we say hyperkähler structure, that's one way of packaging it. It's more um, this pencil of connections is a, a sort of more geometric way to think in a way. Um, and then whenever you have one of those, you can define the twister space by quotienting by, well, taking the leaves of this distribution. Right? So the image of um, this, this connection, we had a whole pencil of connections and each one of them defines some distribution. We take the quotient um, and we get the twister fiber Z epsilon and we put those together into a twister space. And you can see that when, when epsilon equals zero, well, of course you have to rescale, but it means you're taking the leaves of the vertical guy, V. So you're taking the leaves of this distribution, which of course is just the space S. So the central fiber is gonna be S. And if you have an appropriate C star action on S, then you, well, that's, yeah, then you'll get an action on Z. Okay, so I think I'm pretty much out of time, right? Yes, I very much am. Um, so I should just say that, um, yeah, so I had one more slide, which I was never going to get through, but there's just one thing I want to mention, which is that uh, on the archive, there is a construction of, um, of this, this kind of thing, this pencil of connections on the space of quadratic differentials. So exactly the thing we were, um, we were discussing. So yeah, so in this theory of class SA1 case, the stability space is a space of quadratic differentials, and therefore we're expecting some kind of complex hyperkähler structure on the tangent space of that. And basically, we've given a construction, a moduli theoretic construction of, of, that, of that thing. Um, so yeah, so in, in the case of these theories of class S, um, we both have a, a sort of understanding of where the twister space is looking like, and we also have some moduli theoretic description of the complex hyperkähler structure itself. So, uh, you know, that's quite a good, um, uh, I mean, that's, that's definitely a start, but clearly I'm sure came across in the talk, there are many things here that we, uh, we don't understand too well. So I'll stop there, thank you. I hope you could hear the applause, Tom. Uh, yes, so we, have time, we have time for some questions, uh, maybe first from folks in the room. So I have a question, Tom. Yeah. Um, which parts of what you said, if any, uh, would involve the WKB analysis of your families of connections? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, I need to think about that. Um, of course, yeah, because I mean, we get. Sorry. I, so, I mean, we're going to want to think about this equation, and we're going to want to put an epsilon in there and think about its monodromy. 
which is exactly where WKB analysis comes in, right? Um, and it seems to me, I mean, it feels like what, what you would need WKB analysis for is showing that these two constructions are the same, I suppose. Um, because, yeah, so I would take the Goncharov coordinates of these and I would take their logs and I would um, put those into my first construction. And then I would want to know that that extended over the central fiber. And that would be precisely the condition that somehow epsilon times that thing um, had a fixed limit. So I, I, it, it's a really good question and I can't quite put my finger on the answer, but I think what it's saying is that, um, yeah, I think that's what you need to prove that these two spaces are the same. Great, thank you. Um, and let's see, I think I saw a few hands raised. Uh, if people have questions from Zoom, you could just speak up. Uh, excuse me, may I ask a question? Uh, 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 so uh, the, uh, there is a, some problem with a, a hypercarry structure on the space of projective structures because uh, it's, uh, well, it, it, among projective structures, there is a distinguished subset, which is a, a quasi fuchsian uh, projective structure. And somehow I always felt, maybe, maybe it's not, this, uh, not right, but uh, is there is some chance that half have projective structure, uh, hypercarry structure, not the whole projective structure space. For example, uh, there is no, uh, uh, if you take uh, anti homomorphic evolution on the space of of uh, local system. Uh, then this uh, this anti homomorphic evolution is not uh, cannot be extended to the to the projective structure and but can be accepted to quasi fuchsian groups or even smaller smaller space. Uh, but uh, with this um, quasi fuchsian groups, uh, there is a question. There is a also some question which cannot I don't know how to approach it because you need to impose some kind of inequality on the cluster coordinates and uh, something like this imaginary part is not so big or something like that. Yeah. And uh, this is, uh, well, something which I cannot how to approach. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you have a, a, an idea in this direction. So maybe that you need to restrict really, uh, well, the space of projective structure is a little bit too big to be happy. Here. I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm not right. Yeah, okay. I'm sure. Thanks for your question. I mean, I, I, you know, I hesitate to answer because I'm sure you know more about these than me. But I, I guess um, one thing I should say is that um, I'm looking um, at complex hypercalar structures, which are definitely um, different to the real hypercalar structures. So, the, of course, there are several hypercalar structures around in this story. I mean, there is the Hitchin structure. But then there is also this structure defined by Donaldson and written about by Troutwine, where in one where in one complex structure it's kind of like a, a neighborhood of the zero section in the space of quadratic differentials, right? And this also re relates to the quasi fuchsian locus. I think you know in one in one complex structure it's uh, it's it's the quasi fuchsian locus. Um, but this is a real hypercalar structure, and I suspect it's much more complicated than what I'm talking about. Um, so, you know, again, I, I didn't get time to say this very much, but um, in the case of the A2 quiver, I can write down my complex hypercalar structure algebraically. I mean, so I, I talked about this pencil of connections and um, you, can, you can write them down using polynomial equations. So, you know, that, that's the extent, you know, so that's much simpler than I suspect either of those real hypercalar structures. Um, and I mean, maybe this is also related to the following point. I described the twister space only over the complex numbers, right? I didn't really talk about it over infinity. Um, so to make a twister space, you should extend over infinity. And um, if you're going to make a real hypercalar manifold, then the twister space needs to have an anti-linear real involute, you know, uh, uh, yeah, it needs to... Um, um, an anti-holomorphic involution lifting the uh, antipod antipodal map. But the twister space of a complex projective structure doesn't have any such condition. 
So there, there need be no relation between the fiber over infinity and the fiber over zero. And so I think there's probably two things you could do here. You take, I, I mean, I've taken, I, I've sort of tried to write down a twister space over the complex numbers. You could either glue it to its cell, to its anti-holomorphic dual and make a, a kind of a real hypercalar structure, or you can just extend it trivially over infinity since there is a C star action. Um, and I think those two things will probably lead to a bifurcation. Um, and certainly I don't want to be making, I, I think what I'm doing is much more simple-minded than making, um, you know, genuine statements about something like this Donaldson hypercalar structure, I mean, which I, I think is a much more complicated thing than, than, uh, than this. So, um, you know, to me, I think there's an interesting story involving complex hypercalar structures, which can all, you know, maybe even algebraic, um, and, and they have a twister space. Um, but the real hypercalar story, I think, is much more complicated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, just, just a little uh, technical question. So if you have a uh, ordinary real uh, structure and you complexify it because uh, hypercalar manifolds have snap all with natural complexification, that's what you obtain is just a particular case of your complex structure or, or not, maybe, maybe I don't. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, you can just mm -hmm. take, you can take the space of all twister lines rather than just the real it's twister lines. Real. Mm -hmm. Complex hypercalar manifold. But I guess it will have special features. Um, uh, well, just for example, because it's twister space has this symmetry, I guess that, um, I, I guess not all complex hypercalar manifolds can be obtained in that, in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. All right. In view of the schedule, I think we better uh, wrap it up here. Let's thank the speaker again. And so we'll start again at uh, 410. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.